let's get started, Ashicorp's Vault. Uh, let me quickly go through the agenda. Um, I will try to set a common ground regarding terminology um, and introducing Vault in a, general, in a general way. Then I will try to discuss about the software architecture. I will try to list what are, to me, the most important use cases. And at the end, I will show you how we use Vault within Giant Swarm. And as Tommy said, if you have any questions, just drop in the chat and we, I, I can try to, to answer at the end. So let's get started. Uh, what is this all about? Um, Vault is an open source software. It's written in Golang by Ashcorp. Um, there are three main high-level features that Vault provides. Uh, those are secrets management. That's the main one. The other two are data encryption and identity-based access. Uh, this comes from the website. Um, let's, go th let's go through all of them in more detail. Uh, the first and main topic is secret management. But before I start talking about this, let me define what a secret is. I'm quoting here Armand Dadgar. He is the co-founder and CTO of Ashicorp. And he says that a secret is any data that can be used for authentication and authorization, as simple as that. Uh, examples are username and passwords, for example, uh, database credentials, TLS certificates, API tokens, that kind of stuff. So what is the problem that Vault is trying to address? Uh, it's what they refer to as the secret sprawl problem. Uh, this problem can be defined as the fact that secrets are spread everywhere in computer systems. They can be, for example, are coded in source code. They can end up in the um, VCS system. They can be in config management or even worse. They can just be are coded in the runtime environment in the servers, basically. This situation uh, leads to a list of problems. Uh, the first one is that there is little to no security. If you have access to the VCS or to the runtime environment, you have access to the secret. There is no real access control about who got access to the secret. Uh, normally, secrets handled this way have very long-lived expiration times, if any. Uh, this becomes a problem in case the secret leaks, because it never expires, basically. Um, another problem is that there is no audit log about who accessed the secret and when. Um, and also, it's hard to rotate credentials. For example, if they get compromised, uh, they, if the same secret is spread, uh, spread all around the place and you invalidate it, it's, it's a huge mess. You have to replace it everywhere. So the idea behind Vault secret management is to centralize everything. So uh, Vault aims at taking all the secrets and put them in a centralized secure space, which is Vault. Um, the advantages of centralizing are four, the main advantages. First, you can ensure encryption at rest. So wherever the secrets are stored, they are encrypted, so whoever gets access to the pure storage can't read the secrets. Uh, you can ensure encryption in transit by ensuring that there is a secure protocol used to communicate with Vault. You can implement access control lists to control what, which secrets each user can access. And last but not least, you can uh, have audit logs about basically a list of who have access to what secret and when. Uh, but how does it work in practice? Um, when an application needs a secret to get access to whatever resource, uh, let's say a database, for example, instead of relying on some local data, it makes a request to Vault. And Vault ensures authentication and authorization, and it provides the secret if if it's authorized. That's in a nutshell secret management. Uh, the second feature of Vault is data encryption as a service. Um, we all know managing cryptography is hard. 
Uh, it involves a cryptographic algorithm and an encryption key. Um, using secret management that I just discussed, we are now able to securely store the, the encryption key, but still our application needs to implement cryptography correctly. Um, in the current slide, you can see what I'm talking about. Uh, if we have some piece of data we want to store encrypted in a database, we need to take the encryption key and we need to use the encryption algorithm to encrypt the data. This is not a trivial task. Uh, it is proven to be problematic and implemented poorly in this securely. So to help with this, Vault provides uh, what they call encrypt as a service. It's a set of APIs to encrypt, decrypt, sign, verify uh, data, basically, as well as management of encryption keys. Uh, in this slide, you see the different approach. Um, the application still has, of course, the plain text data that it wants to share, to, to store in the database. But instead of dealing with the encryption algorithm, it just sends the plain text data to Vault and gets back the encrypted version. And it can just store the encrypted version in the database. Uh, the opposite happens when the application needs to read back the plain text version. It just sends to Vault the encrypted version and gets back the decrypted one. The key benefit here is that there are two key benefits, basically. The first is that there is no access to the encryption key anymore. And the second is that the cryptography algorithm implementation is battle tested by ASHICORP engineers and the open source community. So you are reasonably sure they are implemented the right way. Third main feature is identity-based access. Um, access to all of the secrets and services that Vault exposes is subject to a strict authentication and authorization process, process based on what they call policies. Uh, we will get more into details about this later. So just remember that this is the case. This is a foundational feature of Vault. Okay, let's move on and talk a little bit about the software architecture. Um, from the software point of view, Vault is implemented using a pluggable core architecture. That means there is a core part implementing the business logic and there are four extension points. Uh, the extension points allow implementation of a different entity in the Vault architecture. Let me try to explain what it means. Um, the first extension point is called authentication backend, and it defines strategies in which uh, you can authenticate to the Vault system. Uh, examples of these strategies can range from the basic username and passwords to external login systems such as AWS or Azure APIs. Um, the second extension point is called audit backend, and it defines way with which Vault can write audit logs. They can be as simple as files um, or maybe syslog. Uh, it can write to syslog endpoints. The third extension point is storage backends, and it defines ways where in, with which Vault can write its own internal data. And again, it can be as simple as a file uh, all the way up to a DBMS system. And this becomes especially important when Vault is run in a higher availability setup. Last but not least, the extension point is the secret engine. Uh, this is basically the core feature of uh, Vault. So how secrets are or services are exposed to the Vault clients. Um, for example, one of the easiest secret engines is the key value or KV secret engine, and that allows storing and retrieving um, data, arbitrary data, basically. Uh, other interesting secret engines are the database one that allows to retrieve database credentials, the Azure and AWS ones that allow to get Azure and AWS uh, API uh, users, basically. And other useful secret engines are SSH, used to 
uh, grant authentication to SSH demons and the PKI to deal with uh, self-signed certificates. But how does it work in practice? I mean, I mentioned that Vault exposes APIs and I'm specifically, I'm talking about JSON over HTTP APIs HTTPS to be more precise. <clears throat> um, that makes it super, super easy to implement a client for Vault. Uh, AshiCorp also provides official client libraries for Go and Ruby. And there are community-based client libraries for a whole lot of other programming languages. There is also an official command line tool that also relies on the API. Okay, I mentioned about the built-in access control through these policies. Uh, let me dig a little bit further on this topic. A policy is simply a list of permissions regarding a specific API call to Vault. Uh, let's ignore how policies are defined. We will get back to that in a second. Let's just focus for now on how policies are used. In the current slide, you can see the typical authentication flow. Uh, in this example, the user authenticates to Vault using his LDAP credentials. Vault connects to the external LDAP to check the validity of such credentials. And if it succeeds, it generates an authentication token. The generated token is then attached to one or more, to zero or more policies. Uh, those policies are generated by the Vault administrator and are attached to the authentication backend. For example, we could have a policy named admin that allows a certain list of actions and that's assigned to all users logging in through LDAP belonging to the administrator's LDAP group. Or we could have another policy named user that allows another list of actions and that's assigned to any user logging in through LDAP, not only administrators. But how does a policy look like? Uh, let's consider this get API call. This is just an example call, and that's the one used to retrieve some random key value pair from the key value secret engine. As you can see, this is just a basic HTTP request using the get method. Um, in order for a user to be authorized to make, to make such a request, a policy like the one in the gray uh, rectangle is needed. This is very simple, but very basic. Uh, it's written in the HashiCorp configuration language or HCL. And all policies have the same shape, basically. Uh, they are all applied to a specific path. In this example, the path is secret slash data slash wildcard. Um, the body of the policy has a list of capabilities. In this example, it only includes the read capability. Uh, this is super basic, as I said, and the policies can get way more complicated than this, but I don't want to go too deep into them today. Uh, one thing worth mentioning is how capabilities are mapped to the HTTP methods on the API calls. As you can see from the table, there is no clear one-to-one -one mapping, um, and that makes it a little bit hard, at least to me, to, to, to write uh, policies. So at the beginning, it's normal to use some trial and error to set up the policies. Okay, one last thing I want to mention um, is the concept of sealing. As I mentioned earlier, uh, uh, all internal data of Vault is encrypted at rest. Uh, so the question arises, when Vault starts up, how can it decrypt the data in a secure fashion. Uh, this is how it works. Mm, when we start a vault and the storage is encrypted, we are in a so-called sealed state. Um, the, a, the vault API is already responding, but there is, there is only one operation that is available at this stage, and it's called the unseal operation. Um, unseal is the process with which Vault decrypts the storage for reading it, as simple as that. In order to do so, of course, it needs a decryption key. And the, the decryption key is named the master key. The master key is also stored in the data and it is encrypted as well. Otherwise, it would be pointless. 
It is encrypted using yet another key called the unseal key. Now, the unseal key by default is generated the first time Vault is started with an empty storage, and it uses an algorithm named the shared Samir keys algorithm. Uh, in a nutshell, that means that a single, the single unseal key is split into different sub keys that are meant to be assigned to different people within the company. And the ownership of just one piece of the combined key is not enough to decrypt the master key. But you have you need to have all the pieces in place in order to be able to, you, to decrypt and use the master key. In practice, what does it mean? It means that every time the vault process is restarted, you need one or more administrator to log in to the system where Vault is running and provide their piece of the shared Samir keys. When the last key is being entered, then we can finally decrypt Vault storage. Now, you can imagine this is not very handy, um, especially if you think about running Vault on Kubernetes when the pod can be restarted anytime. <sighs> mm, this is a problem. You can't expect uh, an administrator to just log in every time and unseal Vault for it to be working. Uh, to make the unseal process a little bit easier, the Vault has a feature named Auto Unseal. Without Unseal, the Unseal token is stored in an external service that is considered to be trusted, and the Unseal operation happens automatically at Vault Startup. Uh, for example, uh, supported external services for the auto unseal feature are AWS KMS or Azure Key Vault or JCP KMS, or even you can use another Vault instance just for storing um, the unseal key. All right, uh, now we know how Vault works, how it stores data securely, and roughly how authentication and authorization works. Uh, I want to discuss a few of what are to me the most common and useful use cases. One super basic use case is to store and retrieve shared account credentials between employees. I'm talking about credentials that are shared between many employees inside the company. Uh, this is usually done using specific software such as LastPass, for example. But if the company has a Vault instance, it can be used to fulfill the same need. In this scenario, rather than looking up the credentials from the password management tool, the employee could connect to Vault to retrieve it. Uh, the advantage here is that you have built-in authentication and authorization. So you can say employee A has access to one, two, and three secrets, while employee B to some other secrets, for example. Um, the second case I want to talk about is dynamic secrets. Uh, rather than using long-lived shared secrets to access, to, to access resources, Vault can provide on-demand short-lived credentials. But where can we use this approach? Uh, one example is cloud provider API credentials, and another one is databases. Let's see how it works. Um, imagine we have an application that needs to connect to the AWS API. If we don't use Vault, we need to somehow provide the application with the API key and secret in order for it to be able to authenticate with, with the AWS API. The application directly uses the credentials and connects to AWS. But of course, this approach has all the disadvantages that we discussed earlier, what we named the secret sprawl problem. Let's check how it works when we use Vault. The application doesn't have any AWS credentials stored anywhere. Instead, it connects to the Vault API and it requests access. Um, Vault uh, connects after Vault grants you are authorized to make such a request. Uh, Vault connects to AWS and generates a new set of credentials for you just for this application and this session. And it's a short-lived credential that expires after a configurable amount of time. The application gets back the credentials, the temporary ones, and can finally talk to AWS. A very similar, if not identical, approach can be used with databases as well, such as Postgres or MySQL, for example. Another common use case is data encryption. 
Uh, for example, imagine you have a customer facing application that retrieves and stores credit card data. Uh, you want to encrypt that data before you store it in the database, of course. So one possibility is to implement the encryption logic inside your application. In this case, the end user provide clear text data to your app and your app is responsible to encrypt it using to, to implement the encryption algorithm and to, to store the data securely. One thing to notice here is that the application needs to have access to the encryption key because eventually we'll need to read back the encrypted data to use it. Uh, we know now that we can store this encryption key securely in Vault, which is progress, but still we need to implement the encryption algorithm in our application. We can achieve the same goal by leveraging Vault. Uh, the flow would be roughly this. Our client would still provide us with the plain text data, of course, but instead of dealing with it, we just send it to Vault. Our application just sends it to Vault and Vault sends us back the encrypted version that we can store in the database. And of course, the opposite happens when we want to read back the data. We get the encrypted version from the database, we ship it to Vault, and Vault gets us back the clear text version. A huge thing to note here is that the encryption key never leaves Vault in this case. So it's super secure, it's in there. And the other key advantage is that we are leveraging Vault's implementation of the encryption algorithm. So we are super sure they are very well tested and checked by the open source community and AshiCorp. The next topic I want to talk about is SSH authentication. Um, one typical way of giving engineers SSH access to machines is by distributing their public SSH keys. When a new employee is hired, we take his public key and we deliver to all target hosts where we want to grant access. The same happens when uh, an employee leaves. We need to ensure that the public key is deleted everywhere. Or it does, this also happens when there is a leak of a private key and we need to ensure that the public key is removed. This can be doable in a fairly static environment where the number of targets doesn't change over time. But in dynamic environments, such as Kubernetes clusters, for example, where there is an autoscaler and new nodes get created all the time, this is simply not manageable. So Vault provides two alternative ways to authenticate SSH sessions. One is one-time SSH passwords, and the other is signed SSH certificates. Uh, let's see how one-time password works. So we have this user, this uh, engineer that wants to connect to a remote host. The first thing that it does, it, he connects, authenticates to Vault, and he requests a one-time password. This is normally a number, uh, like an eight digit number. Um, then the user uses that password to authenticate to the remote host. The SSHD daemon in the remote host is configured to use an helper. That's a binary provided by Vault. Uh, it's called Vault SSH helper. And that basically connects back to the Vault instance and checks if the password is valid or not. Um, the password is a one-time password. That means it's valid for one uh, authentication only, and then it needs to be regenerated in order to be valid. There are two problems with this approach. The first problem is that every remote host needs to have direct access to the Vault API. This can be problematic or can uh, result in security issues. And if the Vault instance, for whatever reason, is not reachable, SSH is not going to be possible. That's why Vault provides a second way of SSH uh, authorization, authentication, and it's signed SSH certificates. In this case, uh, Vault um, uses the PKI or public key infrastructure uh, to verify a certain SSH key is allowed to access one server. The administrator generates a certification authority within Vault. 
and distributes the public certificate of such certification authority in every SSH target. When a user wants to log in, it connects to Vault, it provides his own public SSH key, and it receives back a certificate containing his own public key, as well as a signature as signed by the certification authority. The user then uh, logs in to the target using the public certificate, and the SSHD daemon is configured to use this public certificate to verify the signature is valid. If it is, access is granted. The key difference here is that there is no need for the target host to reach the Vault API. The configuration uh, made by the administrator happens only once, and it's about copying this uh, CA certificate and configuring the SSHD daemon. But after that, everything is automatic. Uh, it is sufficient to give the new employee access to Vault and assign the right policies, and SSH is automated. So it's much better, in my opinion. The fourth use case I want to discuss is TLS certificate management. Um, so without Vault, when we need to generate a self-signed certificate, we need to bootstrap a certification authority, which basically is a key pair, public and private key. We then, uh, need, we then need to generate a private key and the CSR uh, certification signing request. And with the sign the signing request with the mm, private key of the certification authority, and we finally get our certificate. Now, if we only have one place that wh where we need to generate those certificates, that's easy. But if, like Kubernetes, we need to generate certificates in many potentially many targets. That means we need to distribute the private key of the certification authority in many places. And again, this is problematic. This is error prone. This is insecure. We don't like that. So how does Vault approach this? Uh, as simple as exposing another API. Um, you can enable, you can create a certification authority inside Vault and Vault exposes for you um, an API to generate a certificate. You just provide the certificate data to the API and you get back the certificate and the private key for the certificate. As easy as that. Uh, the, main, the key benefit here is that the private key or the certification authority never leaves Vault. To be more precise, it is possible to export the certification authority private key in case there are special needs, but in general, this is not advisable. Awesome. Um, last part of the talk, I want to tell you about how we use Vault uh, within Giant Swarm. In case you don't know, uh, in Giant Swarm, we do Kubernetes clusters as a service. Um, this is a high level overview of our typical infrastructure. For every customer, we, earn, we have one of more or more of what we call installations. Uh, an installation is composed of a management cluster. That is a Kubernetes cluster where we install our applications, uh, as well as a dedicated machine running just Vault. Uh, on top of our management clusters, uh, our customers can create as many workload clusters as they want for their needs. We also have a global Vault installations. We named it the Operations Vault, and that's mainly used for the auto unseal features of our installation vaults. That allows the Vault instance in our installation to restart for whatever reason and become operational without manual intervention. So what do we use Vault for? Uh, the first use we have is for TLS. Uh, you might be familiar with the fact that Kubernetes components use TLS for a number of reasons. Uh, they use it for HTTPS, for example, or for mutual authentication of various components. We bootstrap all TLS certificates for both management cluster and the workload clusters using Vault. We implemented a tool named CertCTL. It runs in our management cluster. It talks to the installation local vault and it generates TLS certificates. 
um, that get distributed where they are needed, basically. The second use case we have is SSH. Uh, so we use Vault to SSH in all our uh, virtual machines, basically, um, for both control planes and worker clusters. Um, how does it work? Uh, our engineers connect to Vault, logging in with a GitHub token. Vault checks that the GitHub token is valid token uh, through the GitHub API, and it ensures that the user belongs to the Giant Swarm organization. If it does, uh, the user provides the SSH public key to Vault and gets back an SSH certificate, just like we discussed earlier. And with that certificate, we can SSH in any of the hosts. Uh, last but not least, we also deal with cube configs using Vault. Uh, authentication is identical. We still use the GitHub token to authenticate uh, to Vault. And within Vault, there is a certification authority that generates valid certificates for accessing API servers of Kubernetes. With that, a certificate, we can generate a cube config to connect to the API server. And that's basically it.